Okay, good morning guys and welcome. Uh, the first Friday of the month, so we've got a non-farm payrolls special. Um, we'll be talking about the key data that's uh, due at 1.30 this afternoon in a bit, but um, we're just going to get around the headlines first, of course, and uh, as you can see here on the screen, first up, we need to be talking about uh, UK politics as ever. Um, so quite a key, uh, what we call a by-election, uh, in the constituency of Peterborough uh, yesterday. It's quite an interesting background story. I mean, obviously you can see on the headlines here that Labour won it. Um, that was a bit of a surprise. Um, it was a Labour seat. Uh, it was a bit of a surprise for a couple of reasons. Number one, the previous Labour um, MP for that constituency, a bit of scandal. She actually got uh, given a prison sentence. Um, something related to a, a speeding fine and some dodgy dealings around that but essentially she got given a prison sentence and then Lab Labour kicked her out of the party but she kind of continued to stand as the MP as an independent but then there was a big petition within the constituency and the number of signatures got above the limit and then right she got forced out and so it forces a by-election Now, what's interesting about Peterborough um, they are a leave um, constituency. They voted, 61% of them voted to leave uh, the EU. Of course, Labour all right, has been flip-flopping massively on the Brexit issue, but you know, you would say they're, they're, of course, more on the softer side of Brexit than the Tories are. Um, so Farage sniffed an opportunity here and he uh, put up a Brexit um, uh, candidate for this constituency and, and they were odds on favourites to win because they're a leave constituency because of the the damage done by the previous Labour MP you would have thought the scandal would have damaged uh, Labour's vote uh, because Labour had been flip-flopping on the European issue as expected that actually Farage and his party uh, Farage himself wasn't standing of course but it was expected that the Brexit party would take their first seat in Parliament uh, they failed okay so this is quite interesting so the, they failed by just over 600 votes so Labour managed to cling on to the seat here Brexit party second Tories in third it was all quite tight um, even though the Tories got pushed into third uh, they probably got more of the vote than people were actually expecting but it's an interesting one because on the one hand here you've got a leave constituency not voting for the I guess the two leave parties which would definitely be the Brexit party obviously but also the Conservatives and um, they came in in second and third and, and Labour came in first so obviously Corbyn's loving it uh, this morning also it tells you that the risk the Brexit party presents to the Tories because here's the Brexit party coming in and taking um, 9,800 votes in this election. If, Bre if, if the Brexit party weren't standing yesterday, the Tories would have won comfortably, except they were standing. And this is the point, the Brexit party presents a big risk for the Conservatives. You know, this is quite a good kind of measure, if you like. You know, we had the European elections, obviously. Um, but this was a, a kind of better measure of where the, the domestic thoughts lie. And definitely, no, well, the Brexit party did well, but not as well as expected. Now, what does this mean for the kind of the leadership race, if you like? Um, well, let's have a look at the odds. So obviously, Boris is still um, out in front. This is quite an interesting graphic. Now, who's going to replace May? She kind of officially ended her term yesterday. Um, she will be a caretaker MP uh, until we get to the middle of July when we're hoping to have a, a new Conservative leader being found. And here's a graphic looking at um, not the odds, but this is looking at how many Conservative MP supporters do the candidates have who are running for to replace May. And of course, Boris is out in front here, 42. And there is an argument to suggest that the Peterborough result is a negative for Boris because, if you like, what Boris kind of wanted was that the Brexit party won in Peterborough, demonstrating the public are keen on a hard Brexit, which perhaps would have played into Boris's hands. The fact that the Brexit party lost perhaps shows that there's slightly less appetite for a full-on hard Brexit than some might have thought. That might damage Boris's standing but at this point he's still comfortably in front in terms of the number of supporters he's got within his own party what's the breakdown of his supporters well um, any 60% chance of, of winning this 
and when you've got about 12 people in the race that's a he is still strong favorite what's interesting about boris here is 26 uh conservative um supporters are leave uh campaigners but look he's got 16 actually remainers that's conservative party members who are more on the remain side that are supporting him so indicating that his efforts to try and just bridge that gap and move a little bit back more centrist seem to be uh, paying off his nearest rival at this point at least is gove um he's only 14 percent odds of actually winning um he's got 19 remain supporters and nine leave uh, you can have a look at this article in the ft if you want to go down and look at jeremy hunt um He's got mostly on the on the Remain side, as you can see. But what's interesting, another graphic here is looking at not the Conservative Party race, but actually what's the national mood. And this is the latest opinion polls. Obviously, the Brexit Party, they're only eight weeks old, um, but they stormed the European elections. And so when you're looking at national, this is the YouGov poll, um, the Brexit Party are top. And Labour and Lib Dems have had a big revival. And, and actually here, the Conservative Party in fourth place. So... Um, the Brexit party, after yesterday's uh, Peterborough announcement, is that the kind of beginning of the end of, of Farage? I think he was hoping to, to claim the party's first seat in Parliament, and they've just about failed, even though they were up against the Labour Party, whose candidate had just been given a prison sentence. So um, it's an interesting one. Now, from a, a market's perspective, let's just have a look at the pound through this, and it's been very quiet. So this kind of by-election situation has hasn't really presented much by way of volatility in fact the pound is trading kind of bang in the middle of the range that we've seen over the last couple of days obviously we've had some some dollar weakness through the first part of the week which has led to uh, cable rising here um, but we just flattened off wednesday thursday and this by-election result and theresa may coming into the end of her official term and and then the maneuverings behind the scenes in the leadership race hasn't yet really had much of an impact. Um, but let's look on the daily chart because you've still got you know analysts expecting you know if we do get I mean the reason why the pound's been lower over the the course of May is that you know obviously May announcing her resignation and the idea that we are perhaps going to have a harder Brexit. Um, MP in the shape of Boris and, and what does that mean for the UK economy and ultimately the big level of course which you'll all be aware of um, on the downside other than the May low at 125.68 is that low from back in December um, just down around that 125 handle um, but if we got a Boris MP if we got a hard Brexit 31st of October then you definitely got analysts looking at a key break of the 2018 low and a, and a test of and a test of the big 120 handle always remember that 120 handle from back in 2016 and then start of 2017 i mean that's the the ultimate level on the downside but um obviously plenty of weeks to go ahead of us with regards to this tory party um race so keep your eye on that but for now with this peterborough event negotiated um the pound is quite happy to tread water here, having had a dollar weakness bounce. And I would suggest that today is going to be mostly about waiting for those payrolls numbers this afternoon. And perhaps it'll be the dollar that kind of shapes the direction of this pair. Um, so that's an update on the UK. Um, let's have a quick look back at yesterday before we look at some more um, up to date European information flow because we've had some bad data from Germany this morning and I'll talk about that in a minute but one of the key events from yesterday's session um, was the, uh, the the Draghi uh, the Draghi show so it was the ECB's monetary policy meeting remember they have one of these every six weeks and this is where they convene obviously assess economic conditions and then decide whether they're going to make changes to policy um, are they going to make changes to interest rates? Well, obviously not at this point. Interest rates are at zero. Uh, what was key about yesterday was, you know, what, what's the current assessment? And, and, and the reason why we're worried about the current assessment, and let me just bring up, sorry, I should have had this up. I'm going to bring up a, a European inflation chart. Um, all eyes were, were on this chart, really. And the problem was that earlier this week, Europe announced their inflation rate for the month of May, and it was a surprise drop to 1.2%. Okay, and as you can see on this chart, that's the worst reading for 12 months at least. Go to a five-year chart, got to go back 
yeah, basically 15, 16 months to find the last time that inflation was this low. Okay, do do be aware that the inflation rate of 1.1 percent, which was the 2018 low, is very critical. If we did on this downward tick we're seeing now, let's just say inflation drops below 1.1 percent. That would be then more like a uh, a two-year low, and then the ECB would have a an interesting problem on their hands. So what we were looking for yesterday was news from Draghi. We wanted to know how worried are the ECB about this drop to 1.2%. Clearly, the European economy, as I'll show you with the German industrial production data shortly, the European economy is flagging, momentum is waning, it's a real concern. Um, the ECB only ended their stimulus program at the end of last year, and as soon as they've ended it, really we've had this downturn. It's not all Europe's fault. We've had a lot of risk globally. We've had a, a perhaps a, a dampening of momentum on a global level. We've had obviously U.S.-China trade war risks and all the rest of it. But certainly internally, Europe is flagging, and inflation's back on the downside. The ECB have only just ended their QE program, and it looks like. At the moment, it's like a matter of when, not if, they're going to have to restart it. And we were wanting guidance yesterday. Now, um, Draghi came in uh, and in his press conference, well, let me look at that graphic in a second. I want to show you the, the chart. For, let's, let's, let's use the euro dollar. Um, that's the wrong chart. Let me enlarge the euro dollar chart because it was a choppy old session. I mean, we had a big a sort of hawkish reaction to start. Well. No, let me let me let me go even quicker. We had, we had a we had a dovish reaction to begin with, as the euro quickly sharply broke new lows for the for the session. If I go to a five minute chart, actually, and we'll zoom in on on this activity. Um, you can see break lower very briefly, then a pop and up new highs, and then we drove higher and higher. We would identified the key level up at one thirteen eighteen. That was the high from the day before, uh, and that proved to be the cap on the upside and then things settled and actually the euro dollar pulled all the way back down almost to where we started almost a full retracement then a drift back higher into the close last night what's happened overnight a drift back lower and all in all here we are sat back below the 128 handle pretty much where we were chopping around for the whole of Wednesday's session and for the first part of Thursday's session. So it's like, uh, sorry, for the whole of Tuesday's session and the first part of Wednesday's session. So after all of that from Draghi and all of the volatility that it created, because um, we had a, what well, we had a 120 pip range really off Draghi yesterday with plenty of movement in both directions. But in the end, it's all kind of back to the middle. So why? And, and let's have a look at this graphic because I guess the problem is we're worried about Europe. Okay, we're worried about the European economy. We're worried about that downtick in inflation that we saw uh, for the May reading. So it's what are they going to do about it? And Draghi really came out yesterday and actually was a little bit more forthright with regards to the tool that the the tools the ECB have at their disposal. Because one of the big risks we're worried about is well, do they have any tools left? Rates are at zero. They've just ended a massive QE program. Is there any more? QE appetite in that central bank. So we're worried on that front. But Draghi came out yesterday and definitely said, we have tools on the table. You know, very much in Fed language, he said, look, we're in data dependent mode. We're waiting and we're seeing um, that downtick in, in inflation for the month of May. Um, really, we're going to have to see another month with inflation down there for the ECB to take that more seriously. It might just be a blip lower. Um, but really, Draghi was saying, look, we've got absolutely ammunition to restart our QE program. Secondly, he said, actually, we've got interest rates as a tool. Now, that was a bit more surprising because interest rates are at zero. And so we were thinking there's not much ammunition there. But apparently, according to Draghi, there might be. But the point I want to make here is look at this chart. The problem is, look at the black bar. This is like a timeline chart. The black bar is Draghi's term. Um, so the problem is Draghi's stepping down in November. Um, his eight years will be up and he's going to have a successor and at the moment we're most likely going to be seeing a more hawkish successor probably from Germany we'll have to wait and see but the point is that the ECB president is most likely going to be more hawkish than Draghi it is now therefore has Draghi got enough time left to implement another another dovish um, stimulus kind of strategy to 
guard against that drop in inflation. And this is what I guess markets were trying to wrangle with yesterday. Draghi was trying to be dovish, so the euro initially dropped, but then they're thinking, well, okay, Draghi's not being out and out. I'm not, he's not starting QE here, so the euro kind of bounced, and then it's like, well, okay, he's saying that the ECBR do have appetite to act, but if we get a, a hawkish shift when Draghi leaves, the question is whether the new ECB president is going to be willing to carry on Draghi's uh, strategy. So all of that was kind of in the mix yesterday. And ultimately, in the end, um, if we go back to the chart, um, the euro dollar ends up right now trading pretty much bang in the middle of that um, volatility from yesterday. Um, let me just say, so Draghi was you know, trying to be a bit more clear on the pathway ahead for the ECB. Um, and the reason why we're so concerned is not only that inflation data, but this is bang hot off the press because this is data from the from Germany this morning, industrial production data uh, for the month of April here. So it's a little bit old. This industrial production data uh, can, tends to get delivered quite late. Uh, obviously, we're in June now, and this is April data. But check out the reading. It's minus 1.9%. Now, put a bit of a caveat on that. Industrial production data can be quite volatile, as you can see from this chart. It's quite choppy, but 1.9%, that's more than just choppiness. Uh, if we go back on a five-year measure, that's right at the bottom end of this range that we've seen in the last five years. 2014 was the last time we went below minus two. Okay, So it may well be that this is fine, if the months to come, May's reading, June's reading, if those tick back up to positive, well, OK, fine. This range we've seen play out for the last few years continues. But next month's reading's key. If the May industrial production data for Germany that's not going to be announced for another few weeks, when it does get announced, if it's below minus two, well, then this kind of range is, is done. That would be an indication that the European economy's momentum is weakening even further. That would give further evidence that that downtick in inflation will be ongoing. And it may well be the, the, the thing that forces the ECB hands to take action before Draghi leaves. Um, so that's kind of all in the mix on the ECB. Um, OK, let's shift our attention and... What I actually wanted to do, um, sorry, hang on, let me shift my headline here. We'll talk about payrolls in a second, but before we move away from the charts, let's just give a general update um, of the week. Well, final, final day of the week, obviously, and it's been actually a really solid week for stocks. If you take the S&P here, um, plenty of green over on the right hand side. We have five up days in a row as we speak. Um, obviously, things can change this afternoon. Uh, sorry, I'm not showing you my chart. Here we go. Apologies. So this is the daily chart for the S&P, and I'm just looking on the far right-hand side. Um, five up days in a row. Nice, solid rebound from, obviously, what was a, a big kind of move to the downside, a big break of that 2800 handle. You know, all kind of, well, U.S. trade related with the U.S.-China thing still um, in a negative place, added on top of that Trump's uh, decision to start um, put, put, fo focusing his, his attentions on, on Mexico. Um, but things have just calmed and we're moving a bit closer towards some kind of idea that a deal's going to get done with Mexico. And so stocks have been able to rebound and this is a really solid rebound. Um, technically speaking, let me just go to a shorter time period. Because you've got people looking at the move from yesterday. If you draw a trend line, then this, this kind of sell-off we'd seen, it had a, quite a nice uniformity to it from a trend perspective. And yet, that break to the upside that we got earlier in the week and now into yesterday's session is a nice, clean trend line break, indicating that um, you know, the, the nervousness around the US trade situation has calmed. Um, we'll look at the labor market situation in a second. This is also despite the fact that on Wednesday we got really bad ADP employment figures, but Jerome Powell's got a lot to do with this. Um, Jerome Powell steered the 
Federal Reserve communication to a slightly more dovish angle earlier in the week. And that's really what's got things moving on the upside. Really big shift in expectations about um, the Fed's willingness to act and cut rates. And you've even now got you know, the general consensus being we're looking at three interest rate cuts from the Fed. I mean, the probability of three rate cuts um, is now up. I believe it's up at about 65%. There's a 65% probability the Fed will cut rates three times over the next uh, nine to 12 months, let's say. The point about that is if you go back just four weeks, the probability of the Fed cutting rates three times four weeks ago was at 3%. So we've moved from a 3% probability of three rate cuts to a 65% probability of three rate cuts. Who likes rate cuts? Stocks. So the S&P 500 prices rifling north despite the trade war risks. Um, so another kind of buy the dip scenario here. Now the big question is how, how far can this upward rebound go? And history tells us it can go all the way. Um, but we do have growing risks, um, clearly with Mexico and China, but then also this whole European momentum slowdown. Um, Obviously, Brexit's still on the table as a problem. Uh, so we shall see. But there's nothing like a good kind of bit of Fed dovishness to stoke the fires of the equity bulls. And right now, as I speak, we're testing the highs for the week. Uh, that, that was the high that was set yesterday, uh, 28.53. And indeed, we're actually moving slightly above it. So a new high for the week here. And, and in terms of levels further on the upside, if you're looking at the S&P, then you know, a key top would be up around the 28.94 level, just shy of 2,900. We're quite a way off that. I, I, we're not going to get there today, no way. But maybe next week, if this positive sentiment can continue. Some of, it, some of it might depend on what happens this afternoon. So let's have a kind of final focus on um, this afternoon. Uh, we've got non-farm payrolls coming out of the US. So of course, this is the um, the, the key monthly labor market report. And the reason why people are, well, I guess what's made this a little more interesting is what happened on Wednesday. So one of the key metrics that will be announced is something called non-farm payrolls, as most of you will know. Non-farm payrolls, that will be announced at 1.30. That's the measure of how many jobs were created in the month of May. Uh, what we had on Wednesday was what's called the ADP employment change. And this is looking at the private sector only, and it was a disaster. Um, we saw this collapse. It was way worse than expected, down at just 27,000. Now, you go back on a 10-year time frame, that's the worst reading since 2010. We've got an, all of a sudden a nine-year low on private sector job creation, according to the ADP. All right. Um, now, what does this mean for this afternoon's payrolls? Well, let's check out the chart looking at non-farm payrolls. Um, and, and the thing about April was we had a very strong reading. So in April, we had 263,000 um, for non-farm payrolls. What are we expecting today? 185,000 is today's expectations. Despite the fact the ADP number was so low, you've still seen expectations remain fairly solid. Here's a look at what the big banks are expecting. This is after the ADP reading we got on Wednesday. You've still got most of the big banks being relatively bullish. Um, UBS at the top of the list at 208,000. Goldman's up at 195. Um, you've got NatWest and an RBC bang on the market consensus, which is 185,000. You've got some bears in the mix. Uh, some of the bigger guns like Citigroup and Credit Suisse down here. Deutsche Bank at 160 as well. JP Morgan, um, Sockgen, even more bearish. So um, this is what the, the big boys think. Um, I don't know. It's Let's go back to that chart. Well, the, yeah, I guess the other thing to say is it's not just about job creation. It's also about wage growth, and it's thinking about the Fed, and it's thinking about inflation. On the wage growth front, we're expecting, um, well, we're expecting the annualized reading to be at 3.2%. Uh, last month, the wage growth number slightly disappointed, which offset marginally that really bullish headline number. So keep your eye out for the wage growth data, um, of course, uh, this afternoon. But if we flick back to my charts, um, you know, obviously the obviously the S and P here is on a tear. K 
can it move higher? Well, well, it can. I mean, what will prevent it moving higher? What you've got to be careful about today, I would say, is really bullish data. If you get really strong non-farm payrolls, you know, surprisingly strong given the ADP reading. If you get, maybe more importantly, if you get the wage growth data coming in really strong, well, that is going to then offset some of the Fed dovishness that we had earlier in the week. The Fed can't be dovish if wage growth is ramping higher because they're going to start to get worried that inflation is going to start to rise and they can't cut rates in the face of rising inflation no matter what Donald Trump wants. So be careful today with stocks. If you get really strong data, especially on the wage growth front, don't be surprised if stocks sell off um, because they'll be concerned that the Fed can't deliver three rate cuts. Okay, so be careful of that. Slightly counterintuitive, strong jobs data, you might see equities move to the downside. None of that kind of confusion with the dollar. And I would suggest, you know, if you're looking at cable, perhaps, here you've got a bit more room to move to the downside than you have on, on euro dollar. So strong data, be looking for short cable, looking for dollar strength, looking for a break of that um, the low that we had from yesterday at 126.74 and looking for a move down towards that 126 handle, okay? Giving back the weakness that we'd heard, uh, seen earlier in the week. So certainly looking for some dollar strength off some bullish data. Obviously, it might be the opposite. Obviously, it might be weak uh, data. It may well be the ADP is correct and we're going to see um, a, a drop on the headline payrolls. If, it, if, that, if you get a drop in payrolls, if it's below 100,000, plus if you get weak wage growth data, well, fine. You know, this three rate cut idea, well, the probability is going to rise even further and you are going to see dollar weakness continue. You're going to see a, a break of the double top that we had, that we have in place so far for cable uh, for the week. And you're going to see cable and euro dollar move to the upside um, in the face of that uh, Fed rate cut expectation continuing to rise. Gold's an interesting one. Let's have a little look at that. Gold's had a, just a phenomenal period over the course of, of well, this, this week and end of last week, just so explosive to the upside. Um, you know, some key technical breaches. And so let me just move that in the end. We just kind of caught some resistance at what uh, at the high of the year. Basically, we've got a double top for the year right now. Uh, but just an amazing run here, trade war risk, um, Fed dovishness, uh, all in the mix here, powering things higher. So uh, less room on the upside here for gold off dovish data. So if you get bad news from the labor market report today, don't expect too much more on the upside from gold. It's already gone an incredible distance. The big trade for gold is going to be on the downside, um, and that will be off really strong U.S. data then you're going to see that rate cut probability subside. And so m way more, uh, I, I'd only be trading gold this afternoon if it's a short of strong kind of hawkish data. Okay, um, So that'll be at 1.30. I'm just going to finish with the price of oil because um, I've covered most markets here, but we haven't looked at oil yet. Oil's had a nice rebound um, and it's recovered uh, the big downside um, that we got on Wednesday's session, if I just add a couple of key lines in here, the low point that we had back at the end of last week. Uh, so, sorry, I should say the start of this week. Broke it on Wednesday off the bearish inventory data from the US. That, to a degree, pre presented some resistance. But um, yesterday, uh, we broke it to the upside last night. Um, you know, the kind of bullish sentiment as stocks continue to rise, uh, certainly helping oil lift off those those low points. And do remember that on the daily chart, I guess like gold, oil's had a phenomenal few weeks, but in the opposite direction, of course. Um, and, you know, clearly the trade this afternoon would be uh, oil to the upside of bullish data, I, I would guess. But the problem with that is bullish data will bring dollar strength, which might hamper the upside a little bit. But um, oil's so low here, relatively speaking, um, that any kind of sense that we've over-exaggerated our concerns about the global economic slowdown, any kind of sense that's the case, then oil's got a decent amount of room to rebound on the upside. Um, okay, so that's it then for my briefing. Uh, final 
uh, sort of session of the week. Uh, keep things tight this morning. Tends to be relatively quiet prior to the, the big data that we were, were, were expecting at 1.30. Okay, so otherwise, um, that's it from the desk. And uh, enjoy your weekends. Thanks very much.